Greetings, the Lord is with you. I'm Pastor Bob Quaintance from Good Hope Lutheran Church in Boardman, Ohio. And this year, in 2022, we're traveling through the New Testament one chapter a day, five days a week. Today on November 14th, we are on the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> Tomorrow evening, Tuesday and Wednesday, I have, uh, I'll be in meetings. Tomorrow is um, a council meeting and then on Wednesday, I'll be teaching and leading the Life-to-Life uh, -life Discipleship Experience. And so I won't be on until Thursday. But we switch tomorrow to the book of First Thessalonians, and we'll be in First and Second Thessalonians for about uh, uh, a week and a half. And both books are about the uh, uh, awaiting the coming of Christ. So they are anticipating his second coming and have much to say about that. So I, I invite you to follow along, as I will, in daily reading, but then uh, I'll be able to uh, speak to the issues uh, on uh, on Thursday. I'm late today because I'm just getting back from, or getting home, from the uh, annual meeting of our Shepherd of the Valley Corporation. Uh, we have, for 50 years, this was the 51st annual meeting, uh, for 50 years, we have been uh, caring for the uh, uh, senior population of the Mahoning Valley. And uh, what a privilege it was. I've been in town here for 31 years, so it wasn't all that old. And we still, when I first came, there was still only one facility, our oldest facility, which is no longer there. Uh, and now we have four facilities and uh, so I'm so grateful that uh, this ministry is going on. Good evening, Mark. I'm glad that you saw that I was on. So I'm just getting back from the Shepherd of the Valley annual meeting and able to get on. I, I didn't even think I could get on, but because this is the last chapter of the Gospel of John, I wanted to be able to do that. I know some people will see that I've, I've gotten on and, and get on later. So uh, we begin with the sign of the cross as we do each night and say we are under the care of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you very much, and let's pray. Lord, uh, we have journeyed for four weeks through the Gospel of John, and Lord, we thank you for uh, this powerful witness to who Jesus is. Lord, in this final chapter, it's um, it's like an afterthought that that John needed to write to add in. So Lord, help us to hear the special message of this last chapter. Um, and Lord, to take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'm sorry, I... I got to thinking about something somebody said today, and it I, I, I got off base there for a second. So we ended chapter 20 by John saying, kind of like an ending to the story. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book, the seven great signs plus the resurrection. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If we study the book of John, the Holy Spirit can draw us to faith and we can find life and eternal life. But then he goes on to add, after this perfect ending, chapter 21. So, oh, and, and if you remember when we were in chapter 8, I shared with you how the first opening verses and the last verse of chapter 7 aren't in any of the oldest um, uh, translations or uh, uh, oldest uh, archaeological evidence of the manuscripts. That's the word I was looking for. Aren't in the oldest manuscripts. And so it was obviously added later, but the thought is so consistent with John that it might have been somewhere following along, but in any event, certainly not there in the original. But there's no doubt that chapter 21 was part of the original. <coughs> so it was meant to be added in as an epilogue uh, a rest of the story. So let's hear it. We left uh, the story with Jesus coming back for Thomas, the doubting Thomas, who 
had this great confession of faith we saw on Friday, on my Lord and my God. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter called the twin, or excuse me, Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John, uh, and two others of the disciples. So you have Simon, Thomas, Nathaniel, uh, James, John, and two others. Seven of the disciples uh, were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Reminiscent of the time in the other Gospels that Jesus called uh, the disciples. Just as day was breaking, the sun was just beginning to come, perhaps not even yet visible or just barely. If you've ever been up before sunrise, it can be awful long wait while you see the sky beginning to lighten, but can't really see much. And then it gets a little brighter and a little brighter. And finally, maybe even a half hour before sunrise, you can see a little distance. And then finally sunrise and warmth begins to hit you. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. Verse four, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So maybe he was a little distance away. Jesus said to them, children, do, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did what Jesus said. This is what followers of Jesus do. They hear his voice and they follow him. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, that's one of those seven disciples on the boat, I think the, the brother of James, John, the son of Zebedee. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, pitch the Lord. Who else could do that? It's another sign. Good evening, Susie. I'm so rejoicing with you over the happy news two weekends ago. Uh, and uh, so congratulations to Sarah and everyone. And uh, we're in John 21. So Jesus told them, throw the net in the right side of the boat and you'll find some fish. Well, some fish, they found a huge quantity of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved instantly knew the only person to do that is the Lord Jesus. Uh, therefore, he said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. You might say he was working hard and he was down to his uh, boxer shorts or something. But he, he threw on the outer garment, uh, the robe that they would wear. And um, uh, he threw himself into the sea. He waited for the boat. He wanted to see Jesus. He was thrilled to see Jesus. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. For they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got the boat, got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? He didn't need it. Remember he had five loaves and two fish and he fed thousands and thousands of people. We're not told how many fish are on his fire and bread, but there's enough when Jesus is there. But he asked them to bring theirs. I, I think it's like our offerings. When we offer things to God on Sunday morning, he doesn't need our offering, um, but he knows we need to give. And, and that our gift is, is a, a gift that grows our faith. And that growth of faith is something we need. Good evening, Joyce. Glad you're on. So he said, come, bring some of your fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard 
and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, um, we know this is a true story because he counted every single one of those things. And that's what fishermen do. They want to measure their fish. They want to count. They want to have a story to tell. And Peter and Andrew and James and John are fishermen. And, and so they caught these fish and they weren't little ones. They, they were large fish. He caught a hundred and a full of large fish, 153. And Peter, man, he is a big man. The, every depiction we have in the scriptures and, and then from movies afterwards is that um, that, that Peter is a, a, a large, stocky, strong man. So although there were so many, the net was not torn. No, Jesus doesn't lose any whether he's catching sheep or catching fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples asked him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord Jesus. Jesus came and, um, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples. The first time when Thomas was not there, the second time when Thomas was, and now at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this was the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he had been raised from the dead, after he was raised from the dead. It appeared many more times, but this is just the three that John is telling us about. But why tell us this story? Well, they've caught the fish and Peter threw himself into the sea about a hundred yards off and he swam and, and walked out of the water. You know, he got to, sh to the place where he didn't need to swim. And he started walking up as quick as he could to go see the Lord. What's going on? And what's going to go on? Well, the first thing he does is he feeds them. I, I think of the sacrament. Jesus gives us his body and blood and his forgiveness. And he knows that we need it. That's why he, he commands us uh, to come to the table, take and eat take and drink. He knows we can't live without the food that he provides. He feeds them. And having fed them, he sends them out. Just like we do in church. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Verse 15. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, ah, he's come back for a little lost sheep. The last time we saw Peter, he was trying to slash off the slice the head of uh, of uh, a guard and a servant in two, missed and got his ear. And then we saw him uh, denying Christ outside the high priest's home. Oh, we've we've known that he was running to the tomb, and, and um, they didn't yet believe, but they believe after Jesus comes, and he's there when Thomas is there eight days later. Jesus comes for Simon, you know, I, I, and he's going to talk to Simon about something bothering Simon. I, I think about, things pop into my brain sometimes. I, I don't know if it happens to anybody else, probably not. But things in the past that I've done that weren't done well, were done wrong, mistakes, I tend, when things pop into my mind, they aren't generally successes. They're generally failures. And I cringe when I have those failures, the remembrances come to mind. I think something's happening with Peter that might be very true, that is true for me. It, it might be true for him. I, I wonder if his failures are, have popped into his brain and Jesus is coming back for him. And, and to do something about those failures. First, he feeds them a meal. And then when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He denied Christ three times. Some of the epistles or some of the gospels tell us that he did it with cursing. I do not know the man with expletives deleted. He, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Simon said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Well, I believe that's absolutely true. I, I know that Peter believed it was true. He loved the Lord, but he also knew he failed the Lord. Jesus asked, uh, said to him, feed my lambs. Peter, you love me and you fail me. It's okay. You feed, the, you feed the flock. I have work for you to do. You don't have to be perfect. I make you perfect. I forgive all your sins. Now go feed others with the forgiveness that you have received. Feed my lambs. Jesus said to him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I wonder how that felt. Those times that I, I remember failures and, and I kind of cringe or I say something out loud that maybe I ought not to say. Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him the second time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. I want you to care for the flock of God. Now, we know from other gospels that, that Peter was the leader of this band. This fallen man who's been humbled by God is being raised by Jesus. You tend the lambs, you, you tend the flock. And he said to him the third time, just like the three times of denial. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, that must have cut to the core. So he said the truth. Irregardless of his failures, he did love the Lord. And so he said, Lord, you know everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, you know everything. You also know that I love you. Jesus knows it. He said to Peter, this man who loved him imperfectly, but who loved him, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, the word of Jesus the first two times is agape. Do you agape? God, it's always used of God's kind of love. Eh? Over, uh, it, it's a selfless giving. Um, it's, it's a giving without anything to be expected in return. It's, it's God's love, sacrificial. Um, Peter each time responded with the Greek word phileo, which means love, but it means brotherly love. Not just one-way love, but but mutual love. I, I love you, you, you. I love you as you love me. It, it the third time Jesus asked him, he didn't say, "Do you agape me?" He said, "Do you phileo me? Do you love me as I love you?" Peter said, "You know everything, Lord. You know that I love you." Even in his questions, Jesus came down to him, to his level, what he was able to commit to. I, I had a conversation with a, a brother in Christ, um, um, doesn't live in this area, but but uh, we were on the phone and he, he uh, in our conversation, I had an opportunity to say that I'd heard a definition of a, like a real Christian being a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. I said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to meet that person, person who's fully devoted, 100% devoted to Jesus, never a thought that has gone amiss, never an action that is wrong. I don't know that person. I'm not there yet. I will be one day. One day I will see Jesus as he is and I will become like him. That's what the scriptures say, but that's not yet. Uh, Peter's not a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, but this is what you can say. He loves Jesus like Jesus loved him. And he'll give his life for Jesus and he will tend the flock. For a person who's, who's overwhelmed by his failures, 
what would it mean that Jesus comes and asks, do you love me? And that Peter could honestly say, yes, I know I have failed so many times. But if Jesus asked me, do you love me, Bob? I'd, I'd say, yes, Lord, not very well. Not all the time, not like I should. But you know my heart. I love you, Lord Jesus. And then to hear these words three times spoken, that Jesus says, feed my sheep. Tend my sheep, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He entrusts the ministry to Peter, a man who loves him and whose failures do not prevent Jesus from using him. We can always come up with a long list of reasons why we can't do something, but Jesus is inviting Peter to take his humility and, and his love and be willing to be used by Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this was to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. They will stretch out your hands. That's what they did to Jesus on the cross. And Peter, Jesus is telling him, when, when you, you love me, well, I, a, a seminary professor uh, from the North American Lutheran Church likes to say, if you follow Jesus, you have to look good on wood because we're to take up our cross and follow him. And what happened to him will happen to us in some way, someday. He says to Peter, you're going to have to stretch out your hands. They will stretch out your hands. You won't just be yawning. They will hold out your hands on the beam and they will tie you down and throw the, the nail the, the spike through your, your wrist, your hand. This verse 19, he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. He told all the disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He's just repeating it to Peter. He's choosing Peter. Peter who has failed him. Peter who remembers the failures. I think Jesus is trying to say, Peter, I want you to remember I have called you and I have loved you and I have forgiven you, and I want to use you. I choose you, Peter. And that can be said of you as well, everyone that's listening to this now or, or later, in the midst of your failures, your incomplete love, Jesus chooses you to go make disciples of all nations, to go tend the flock, to be a connection, as I preached about yesterday, to be a joint, a connecting point between the, the love of God and, and people who need that love. Or as my mom's, uh, the, the note in my mom's Bible said that I, I shared yesterday, a Christian is a, is a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, a hand through which God helps, a life through which Christ lives. Well, he's calling Peter to be that Christian life. Follow me. Well, what did Peter do? Very interesting. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them at some distance. Um, but he turned and he saw, I believe, John, the disciple John. The one who also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Uh, well, that was Judas. Peter didn't betray him, but he did deny him. And all of them ran away. Well, when Peter had turned around and saw him, he said to Jesus, what about this man? This is the man that is throughout the gospel called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Why isn't he the, the leader of the church? We're not told. Jesus chose Peter. Jesus chose Peter 
with the memory of all his failures, to be one who would listen to his voice and lead the church. What, what a powerful word. When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. We always want to look at other people. Well, what about this person or what about that person? No, Jesus is saying, Bob, what about you? You follow me. Don't worry whether anyone else follows. I want you to follow me. He says that to each of us. And then a final word here about that. Verse 23, the spread, so the saying spread abroad among the brothers, the, the Christians, that the disciple whom Jesus loved was not to die. Yet John, who's writing, wants to be very clear about this. Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die before Christ came. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Very clearly, Jesus never said he wasn't. See how things get misunderstood and passed around even in the church. But John, who heard him say it, and Peter too, but John, who's writing, heard Jesus say that, and he wanted to be very clear. No, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to be alive when he comes back. No, no, no. He said, if I want him to be alive, what does that matter to you? It's none of your business. Your business, Peter, is to tend the flock, do the work I'm calling you to do. I'll tell John what he needs to do. And God had a different path for both of them to walk. But they both followed him. He's the shepherd and his sheep follow him. Now he ends it this way. Verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. John's identifying himself here. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Of course, he wrote that in his day when there maybe weren't so many books like today. But there would have been vast libraries. But Jesus did so much. So he couldn't. It's hyperbole, I suppose. But you couldn't tell everything that Jesus did. But these have been written that we, as we, as we heard at the end of chapter 20, that we might know that we have eternal life. And this last story has been written for all of us who are not the 12 disciples, but who are, like Peter, with memories that at times cause us to have regret. Jesus still chooses you. He loves you and he calls you to do your work that he gives you to do. To follow him, to deny yourself and take up your cross and to care for the other sheep. May God bless each of us in that calling. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Though we got started late, um, uh, I am so grateful that we could spend time in John chapter 21. I pray, Lord, your blessing on on the, this passage and the power of Jesus' conversation uh, with the, all the disciples, his invitation to eat, to bring their some of their, their, their fish, and then the conversation with uh, both Peter and then John. Lord, bless us to be living without the pain of the accusations of the enemy, but to know that we are forgiven and we are chosen by you. And if the devil comes to our mind to remind us of some evil that we've done or something, some regret, something we've failed, that we can say, well, that's true, but it doesn't matter to Jesus. So it doesn't matter to me. Lord, help us to fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of faith. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to be with us tomorrow night. I'll be at council meeting. And I won't be on Wednesday night. I'll be teaching the Life to Life Discipleship Experience class. But I will be on Thursday. And we'll, uh, tomorrow though, in our daily reading, we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'll be back with you when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 in both First and Second Thessalonians, which will take us about a week and a half. Uh, tell, uh, look forward to the, and are talking about the, the second coming of Christ. Well, God bless you. Remember always, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.